So uh, welcome back uh, and keep up the conversation, as I said, but not now and not in this room. So um, we've had a discussion on religion and society, the global exchange. We've heard from the top policymakers, Federica Mogherini, uh, those who have taken part in constructing and crafting and testing uh, the exchange and pilot projects. We've heard from the foreign policy experts and their experiences, good and bad, in talking about religion in society. Their need to, as uh, Mireta put it, deal with something that has snuck up on them, sneaked up on them, uh, religion, uh, but also being careful not to instrumentalize and to work with people of all faiths and people who are secular and uh, not religious. So we've gone to that. Now it's important to talk to the practitioners, those who in different ways, innovative ways, creative ways, faith and non-faith ways, are actually implementing practicing uh, what we have been talking about. So let me introduce them very, very briefly. Um, Mr. Itonde Kakoma, uh, Program Director for Africa at uh, Crisis Management In Initiative, and worked, of course, a lot in Africa, but also you've been part of the Carter uh, Institute as well. So, welcome. Uh, Shamil Idris, Chief Executive Officer of Search for Common Ground, using also very innovative uh, technologies to reach out and create that um, narrow, but widening, I hope, under your direction, Shamil, uh, common ground. Stephen Sheshua, co-director of the Caravan Sarai Collective and former director of the Three Faiths Program, uh, Forum, sorry, welcome. And last but not least, uh, Elisabetta Kitanovic, executive secretary for human rights of the Conference of European Churches, working very much in the Balkans. Right, so as, as before, uh, I'm going to ask uh, all four of you to actually talk about your experiences in uh, practicing what we have talked about, the different ways in which uh, you have been working. So let me turn to you first, uh, Mr. Kakonda. In um, uh, Kakoma, so in your conversation on religion, when you are actually implementing many of the initiatives, many of the exchanges, creating that kind of coexistence uh, paradigm, what are, the, uh, what are the, your experiences and what would you like to share uh, with the Global Exchange? Well, thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice has been troubled by the change of weather in Northern Europe, so if I, if I need to clear my throat, uh, permit me. But first, as you indicated, I work principally in the realm of political dialogue. Mm -hmm. However, as an individual, I think the mic is gone, as an individual, my formation is broader than that and stems in particular from a theological and even liturgical kind of bearing. I rarely say that in public settings. I feel free enough to say that in this setting. Having said that, though, I rarely explicitly refer to this formation, even though it deeply shapes what I do. And I think the high representatives framing this morning around fear and understanding is also how I'll present some of my own uh, considerations. But for a reference point, I would argue that the best formation, in addition to learning by way of a kind of an apprentice from senior mediators in the field of resolving violent and or political conflicts, the best formation I've had to date has been deeply theological, be it from a language perspective, translating sacred texts, or from a clinical pastoral education perspective, where I spent uh, a very formative period at Johns Hopkins Hospital, uh, learning, uh, trying to understand how my biases impact patient chaplain encounters. That still to this day, 20 some odd years later, is very much a part of who I am in reflecting, absorbing, uh, my own um, bias considerations. Now, if religious questions are excluded, and I think Bitta said it very well, from considerations in resolving political and or violent conflict, we do it precisely at our own peril. But so too, uh, if we exaggerate religious questions uh, and overly uh, allow them to dominate uh, the reality of political and or economic and geopolitical conflicts, we inflate the importance of religion. And, and this false dichotomy 
uh, is also reflected in forests such as this uh, and the way in which processes are, are designed and undertaken. And I'll give you two examples, mindful of the brevity of our interventions. Without reference to country or name of sitting head of state, perhaps those who are familiar with uh, the Great Lakes can infer. But there is a current kind of political conflict uh, that is emerging uh, in or exists in the Great Lakes of Africa in which a sitting head of state has... Uh, sorry, the mic keeps going in and out, but I'll, I'll project. Maybe, maybe try using another one. Here. A sitting head of state has understood his position in society through an eschatological vision a God-given right, uh, inscribed through prophetic vision, uh, and enhanced by way of self-declaration of uh, both he and his partner in terms of uh, uh, leaders of a broader faith community. Now, the extent to which that perspective is taken seriously in ongoing regionally-led political dialogues is negligible. It's referenced on occasion as a factor, but often in jest, and is not a part of the consideration in terms of how a perspective, a deeply formative perspective on how reality is taking place in this sitting heads of, head of state's uh, political decision making, it's not a part of the calculation. I'm not suggesting it should be but at least to take it more seriously than uh, a slight occasional humorous gesture in terms of how this individual's bearings religiously are shaping decision making and solidifying his place as head of state, not just now, but ad infinitum. Mm -hmm. The second point I would make is, and it relates to overinflating the role of religion. And here, powerful liturgical gestures come to mind. Many of you would have seen this very inspiring video of uh, the current Pope's encounter with uh, heads of state, a uh, head of state rather from South Sudan and other leaders. I see you nodding your head, the kissing of the feet. I watched that with great interest, but also great concern. Precisely when a prime minister from the region who had been involved actively, actively in brokering yet another agreement in South Sudan said, if this doesn't make a difference, then I don't know what will. Mm. And I thought to myself, that's a totally peculiar reading of what is unintended. It is a gesture, and here I speak from my own tradition and liturgical perspective, it is a gesture that takes seriously the here and now and pointing to something that is yet to come. It is by no means a gesture to suggest that reconciliation between these historic enemies, if you will, is now once and over done by way of kissing of the feet. But that was an interpretation not only by a former, immediately former prime minister who was involved in the brokering of the peace agreement, but of millions of South Sudanese, and that's dangerous. And that's, that's where overinflation, I think, or, or, or where literacy is important in understanding the, both the power of gesture, but also the limitations of it. Because ultimately, in that context, the individuals in that room, all of whom with whom I have humbly been able to work with, accountability, frankly, is a more central question. Mm -hmm than thin gestures of what reconciliation could be. I'll leave it there and perhaps include mm. further reflections in the conversation, discussion. Very, well, very clear. important points. Uh, thank you very much indeed for pointing to that. Yeah, food for thought. Um, Shamil, uh, let's move now to the Middle East, if, if you allow. And I'm reading here that Search for Common Ground has grown to be the world's largest dedicated peace-building organization. That's what I've been told. So congratulations on that. So Shamil, in, in terms of 
In terms of the Middle East, where uh, conflicts don't necessarily start off being religious, though some do, um, and then turn religious because the economic and social and cultural problems then sort of mute or morph into, into religious divides. Um, what is the kind of challenge that governments in the region and you in your search for common ground face? Uh, thank you. I, I, think, uh, I think that governments in, in the region are facing some dynamics that governments everywhere and by extension multilateral institutions like the EU are facing. And there's an additional layer in many Middle Eastern countries, which I'll get to in a moment, that, that can further complicate it. I think the issue that governments generally are facing and multilateral institutions are facing uh, is uh, uh, they are increasingly confronting the rather severe limitations of traditional tools of the state mm. to deal with modern dynamics of conflict, modern challenges to social cohesion, and the degree to which major problems today require us to generate an unprecedented level of cooperation um, across cultures, uh, public private sector. And the traditional tools of the state and the multilateral institutions are simply not fit to purpose. There yep. are plenty of people, I'm sure, here um, uh, and elsewhere who, who believe that the post-World War II order is in fact collapsing. Mm -hmm. um, and what we see is, is, is from 1915 to the turn of this century that, that the investment in that order, including the European Union, the UN, African Union, you know, um, that those investments paid off extraordinarily well and were highly successful at the, one of the main purposes, which was to prevent war between states. And we saw levels of violent conflict plummet pretty steadily from 1915 to the turn of this century uh, to the lowest levels in recorded history. Okay. We're now living at a time of a uh, 30-year high in violent conflict, largely because of two forms of violent conflict that that system simply doesn't deal with very well. Um, one are collapsing states, whether civil war mm -hmm. or regimes turning on their own people, uh, or two transnational violent movements. Reference was made here to those inspired by religion or drawing legitimacy from religion, but at least as serious are uh, you know racial, ethnic, um, and and I go into all of that because. Uh, I don't think that governments and multilateral institutions uh, I using the traditional tools can prevent effectively these kinds of conflicts. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, um, you know, the lens through which I see this entire initiative is, and quite generally having read the papers now for it, um, and I'm not just saying this because it's the architects are here, but quite generally this is, from my perspective, one of the best designed and thoughtful and therefore hopeful efforts um, of an otherwise often fumbling effort of that multilateral system mm. to adapt to the modern world. Um, uh, and when you take it to the Middle East, um, I think that uh, without naming any states in particular, I think when you add to that layer of challenge of state leaders and political leaders to deal with the dynamics of conflict of today, um, uh, a certain level of uh, perceived illegitimacy mm -hmm. of regimes. Um, the lens through which they then see different actors, religious actors, youth, um, <laughs> different actors, is almost always through a security lens mm -hmm. and, and through a fear lens. Um, and, um, and, and that was referenced uh, earlier today, but you know, when what we're seeing all around the world, not just in the Middle East, is you know, certain policymakers, once they are comfortable enough to speak openly behind closed doors, are, are scared of their own youth populations, many of them. Um, and um, I, I think whether you're looking at it from a security lens, I think the engagement of citizen peace building, um, not just religious actors, but certainly including religious actors, is increasingly critical. Whatever the next world order is going to be, whether this one's collapsing or not, or whatever, the it's going to have to much more effectively leverage both state diplomacy and state action with citizen peace building. And this to me is an example, this whole global exchange of a step, a big step in that uh, direction. And I think, uh, and simply by saying, you know, particularly in places where it is this contentious as it is in the Middle East, um, uh, and when, um, you know, the reaction oftentimes of governments to those perceived threats is either to clamp down on them, monitor them and restrict them all the more, or alternatively to try to co-opt them you know, and therefore you see some of the, you know, historically greatest sources of religious uh, thought 
um, in, 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 in this region have been co-opted and really lose their legitimacy in the eyes of the faithful mm -hmm. um, because they've lost their prophetic voice, uh, particularly when it comes to issues that that state is, is you know, perpetuating. Um, you get that reaction from the states. They're either, they're either uh, restricting, monitoring, or co-opting. And the alternative of actually engaging, enrolling, seeking to work in common cause is, is, is really quite rare. It has to come from our perspective from an approach that is patient and builds trust exactly in the way that I understand this initiative seeks to do, which is enable the actors themselves, first be inclusive, mm -hmm. and enable them to determine the issues that they want to mobilize around. And I get the concerns around the safety of the participants. One of the things that you can take a lot of faith in, though, is the participants will know pretty well what the red lines are mm -hmm. in their own context. Mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, and so I don't want to be too sanguine about security concerns, but I think what's really powerful here is if you take an adversarial or uh, a threatening approach to the power structures in that region or anywhere, you're going to get nowhere very quickly. Um, if you take a collaborative approach that looks for the cracks of light, no matter how thin they might be, and seeks to blow them out, you know, and it, it, by you know, generating collaboration around s shared problems, then I think you get something that both will advance mm. you know, solutions to some of these problems they want to work on and build social cohesion at the same time and help state leaders increasingly see not only that these might not be communities you have to fear, but in fact, you can gain a lot and in fact you need them if you're going to meet the demands of citizens today. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so powerful message there as well um, to civil society and you're right people do know the red lines in their respective uh, if I may say so repressive dictatorships uh, or not uh, so thank you very much for that I do have a question on technology and a virtual exchange but let's move on and I'll come back to you Shamil to talk about that um, turning now to you Stephen uh, I'm reading here as well that under your leadership the three faiths Pro forum ran various award-winning social cohesion programs that encourage interaction and learning between people of different faiths and beliefs in the UK and internationally. Tell us more. Thank you. Yeah, awards are always helpful. Uh, they, they give you a, a, another podium to, to speak from and, and really push out your ideas. I think what I'd just love to talk about is some of, around design, uh, about how we implement, because even the most seasoned practitioner make mistakes all the time and it is a learning process so always had the idea around design about going where people are now this is physical but it is also mental we really have to understand who we're working with or we incentivize them to come where we are now this platform has many incentives but with it with both areas we need that literacy that we were talking about before. That's religious literacy, communal literacy, uh, cultural literacy as well. And that literacy is obviously not a closed book, and we have to approach it quite openly. Uh, the way people are believing and belonging is shifting. Uh, we have to take into account of that. Uh, religion can be... Uh, we see religion as a thing. It is, it is much more than that. It is a collection of billions of people living and experiencing things in different ways. We have to understand the intersectionality of it, which was said earlier. But we also have to understand the normative frameworks to work through. Mm -hmm. and I think this initiative that's where some of the tension points will come through, uh, through this uh, more flattening of religion, especially with uh, newer generations, as well as uh, the structured religion uh, that we've been Just speaking about. Explain that slightly. So, <sighs> identity. Mm. Um, I'm a Montreal-born, uh, Iraqi origin, Jewish, um, live with a British passport, proudly European, living in Portugal. Um, <laughs> and I think this also happens with belief. People are um, 
are there atheist Jews? Of course there are, sorry, Alex. Um, le let's, let's not see this as this one thing. It's much more complex. Mm -hmm. And with that, what I like about um, working with the non-religious in this platform is that these can be teased out, more of that complexity, because the more we show our complexity, the more we are human. Hmm. But it's not a Pollyanna world, is it? And in your interaction with different faiths, etc., there must have been some kind of anger or hatred or fear. And how do you then really, in, in this very practical way, how do you overcome that? It's not enough to say dialogue, is no, it? it? Well, no, but what does dialogue mean? It means uh, give voice and listen. Listen. Um, and I, but you, you touch on something really important that I think we ignore at our peril. Emotion. Um, I've been privileged to work in Indonesia on a storytelling and dialogue project uh, called Charita. Um, and we worked with uh, 30, 30 young professionals, five different cities, so 150 uh, young professionals on dialogue, how to facilitate dialogue and how to tell stories. At the end of it, and a lot of people in this room have been in certain these, these same circumstances, they tell stories of themselves, of discrimination. And I'll tell you, there's not a, a dry eye in the place. And that is the connection. Um, we have to bring emotion, and it's not just here, but a lot of here. Again, that is where tribe, a new tribe, is built. And I'll just end with one very quick story. At the end of that program, we brought um, all the 150 practitioners, plus they trained uh, over 2,000, so some of those to a public event on storytelling. At the end of it, uh, the one of someone from USAID said to me, the government has been telling the people um, or the youth, these are the categories that you should be in. This is the youth saying, no, we will not be categorized. We are much more complex. This is the new Indonesia. And so with that, I think there is hope for the future mm. and for this initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, so, uh, Elisabetta, we're working in the Balkans, right? And uh, Balkans is, of course, a very high political priority for the European Union, waiting in the wings, waiting to join the European Union. But the EU officials, I speak to all the time are clearly saying there are problems there, uh, reconciliation hasn't really taken place, there are ethnic problems, national tendencies still there, young people are suffering, many leaving the region uh, because of all the tensions there and also then working within the region to change things. Your experience from the Conference of Churches as religion as a, as a factor that brings people together or actually separates people even more? Well, uh, I'll bring you a few examples from different countries because uh, from one country we have really m several of them. So, and of course, uh, the situation uh, from country to country is very diverse because some of them they are members of the EU, some are on have candidate status, some are about to get the candidate status. So, uh, when we uh, discussed, for example, and received a request uh, from Serbia to discuss uh, uh, human rights issues. We went there and we have discussed uh, basically training on, uh, we have done the training on freedom of religion or belief. Why that was important? That was important because in the communist time, religion was pushed away mm -hmm. from the public sphere. So whether somebody was majority or a minority, they didn't have right to exercise their freedom of religion or belief freely. If they were to do so, they had, uh, they had to face with the governmental, uh, let's say, consequences, being in a prison. Mothers uh, and, and uh, fathers, parents in general, they have been accused for educating children in the wrong way. Education, very important, yes. Education. In order uh, to try to help to um, uh, churches and religious communities in Serbia to get back into the public space, we have organized this training where we have discussed uh, their rights. What are their rights according to the international legal treaties? And uh, one uh, example which came uh, out of uh, one, one strong message which came out from our imam, local imam uh, from Belgrade in this regard, 
he said, why didn't we have this discussion about uh, religious freedom before the war started and not uh, uh, 20 years after? Because this discussion maybe would prevent mm. uh, all this uh, bloody war which uh, happened in the ex-Yugoslavia. Another example that I would uh, bring, it's um, also, it comes from the internet, um, uh, it is concerning internal and external coherence. As Conference of European Churches, we all the time emphasize that, that the values that we have in the European Union, uh, and we wish them to be implemented outside of European Union, uh, also should not be perceived that everything is great and fine within the borders of European Union. Absolutely. And yeah. therefore we uh, uh, have done one exchange between um, Serbian uh, Orthodox minority in Croatia and Croatian Catholic minority from Serbia. They came here and they visit European institutions. So how they excited were, it uh, speaks the fact that Croatians from Serbia came by walk from the airport to the European quarter. Some of you uh, came by taxi. I'm sure you didn't dare to walk from the airport to, to the hotel, but that also speaks about excitement that they really wanted to engage with their peers from another country and uh, with all these animosities and prejudices that they had mm -hmm. about one community and another, it opened up basically that they more or less feel the same. And that was really uh, eye-opening for the both uh, communities instead of being in the mood of blaming one side and mm. another side. We have emphasized that, that it is important to bring young people, and these were young people. They were uh, in their between 20s and 30s, mainly students of bachelor or uh, master degree. Uh, we have paid in, uh, a, a specific attention that we have a gender balance. So because each group was uh, about 10 people, so half of them were girls, half of them boys. Um, and uh, they had a really good time in Brussels. So after many years, I didn't discover a pub which works here until five, six o'clock, but they did it. <laughs> and then what was even more funny, uh, the owner was so. Tur Turkish and uh, the, they listened and Serbian and Croatian songs during the whole evening. And one more example, which is an, on another scale, comes from Montenegro. Uh, recently, the, uh, the um, state wanted to introduce a new law uh, which would regulate uh, relations between religion and state. And therefore, they wanted to bring the concept of laicite from France in Montenegro. And that was, again, uh, very interesting uh, because this concept uh, which was established in France, in the Western Balkans, I'm not really quite sure <laughs> that, it's, uh, that Balkans is really a good, uh, good uh, region to have mm -hmm. concept like that from simply reason that people are believers. Even though religion was outside of the public sphere, it doesn't mean that it went from the people's heart. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So four very powerful uh, testimonies about what it's like to actually work uh, on the ground, if I may say so. I still have a question on technology for Shamil, but, but keep that in mind when I give you the floor later on. Uh, let's take some comments and questions from you. And once again, you know me now, short and sweet. So I see a hand going up there. And please, can I see other hands going up as well? How many other people? Right, please, sir. Hi, my name is Mark Gopin, and I want to, uh, from George Mason University, and I've been working at this and writing about it for about 30 years, and very grateful <laughs> to your talks, and very, very pleased with the initiative. I'm concerned about what Mr. Shoshua has raised that is at the core of a lot of the problems that we talked about and debated today, and that is the tendency to think of religion as faith, which it is not, by any experience of practice and any experience of scholarship over the last couple of thousand years of looking at religions. So we are losing an opportunity by having a false identification of this, of Can faith Can you quickly identify the difference in your mind? Religion faith, and faith is about belief in a doctrine, but religion is about practice, and practices, and ethics, and norms, what he said, normative values, are the places in which religious and secular people, okay. for hundreds of years, have worked on evolving society and universal ethics and universal rights. Right. And that's what's going on on the ground when hundreds and hundreds of veiled women in Syria being bombed trust a rabbi like me because they don't give a damn about my doctrines. They want to know that I'm there to save their lives and, and protect their dignity right. and give them political power against their crazy husbands. That's what they want. 
and they trust me and a whole series of secular and Christian and Jewish people working with them. So this exchange needs, uh, I, I, I'm challenging us to think beyond faith. Okay. And, and I, I want to ask you what you think about that. Thank uh, you very about much. The future. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'll go back to the panel in a minute. I saw uh, a hand going up here as well. Please, sir, put your hand up. Yes, yes, yes. Please stand up, put your hand up. Could you give the, f yes. You can't hold it. <laughs> yeah, my name is Sanaid Kovilica, um, representative of the Islamic community um, uh, here in Brussels, uh, and chief imam in uh, Islamic community Bosnia Herzegovina in uh, Norway. So it's about Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, I'm part of this uh, London Lokahi group. And I'm very happy to be uh, uh, to be one of them uh, because um, we are talking about something that our Europe really needs. Uh, Europe needs this exchange. Europe needs um, encounters. Europe needs meeting places. And I'm sure that this platform will create arenas of where different people um, of different spheres will meet and um, tackle daily challenges ordinary, our ordinary people meet. Um, Europe needs this not only on the grassroots le level, Europe needs this on the high level uh, because we, 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 we are witnessing that politicians do not speak to the religious leaders. Mm -hmm. Religious leaders do not speak uh, to, to the politicians. It happens in the USA. It happens somewhere else. But in Europe, it might be much better. And when, it, um, when, we, when we get it better on this high level, on this high level, there is one another uh, challenge. I come from Norway, I work 20 years in the field, um, it's much better situation there. We really have these encounters. I really with politicians. Uh, with pol I really okay. meet politicians. Right. I really That's meet very good advice. I, I really meet uh, NGO um, representatives. I really meet media representatives. This is the way how to go ahead. We need an alliance of people who will do everything possible to get our lives easy but the, the I I'll the, have the, to the ask the you to uh, the question yeah the well question I mean that, that might be okay. th that is not only for our uh, religious uh, for us religious leaders but also for politicians and in the end actually for this platform when we get it works on the on the high level the question always is how to articulate it how to get it to the grassroots level, because the challenges actually are right. down there. Okay, uh, so that's, thank that's you. Thank you, very, very, very good points about politicians, and also thank you for raising the issue of media literacy, also in dealing with sensitivity on cultural issues. Please, the lady over here. Hi, I'm Carmel from Iraq, a member of the Iraqi Network of Facilitators. At the same time, I'm a Baha'i activist on human rights. Well, my question is, in Iraq, we have a long road in peace building. I think about 10 years, all the organizations, national, international, local, government, are working on peace building. But the challenge is, we are always having new trends of problems. Mm. And what I know that science is developing every day. So when we are working on national level, we feel somehow that we are unable to, to solve the problems until we join the program of Lukahi, which uh, just collected experts from all mm. over the world. The first time I feel, oh, we are not stupid. <laughs> The problem is challenging. So the question is, I hope if all this gathering, all these people 
are not going to duplicate the work that we are working on about 10 years. And after 10 years, we are having new problems. Okay. So I hope the question is to mix this scientific academic field work together to generate new, new not we cannot say solvation, but new initiatives for such countries suffering and uh, at the same time they are representing terrorism to the other parts of the world. Thank oh, you. Thank you very much. I saw a hand go up there. Christian Leffler, if you want to come in front, um, there's a seat reserved for you. Well, you're not disturbing. You, you, all right, whatever. Choice is yours, Christian. Please. Uh, hi, I'm Melissa Ware with the British Council. Uh, Stephen mentioned program design, and this brings up a question I've had since the beginning, and this is generally to the architects, and then also to each, to any and all of you, is how are you defining success in your programs or initiatives, or um, how do you know you've been successful? And I saw, yes, and there, and then we'll go to the back, yeah. I've, I see three, three questions to come, brief, and then we can go back to the panel. Yes, please. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I recently moved from practice to academia in Switzerland. My name is Angela Ullmann. And I'm asking you, the panelists, this because you have rich practical experience in engaging those actors we sometimes perceive to be difficult, whether they might be seen as radical or conservative or orthodox. In my own country, I would call them populist, most likely. And how do you, from your experience, think that this EU initiative can engage not only those who are willing to reach out to other cultures, mm. ideas and values, but those who are not willing. Mm. Thank you very much. Please, at the back and then I'll come to you. And then we'll go back to the panel. My name is Ahmed Laruz, I'm from Amsterdam and uh, I'm a social entrepreneur, let's say, and I'm an impact in entrepreneur. Uh, and I did Lokahi Lebanon, uh, and I was privileged to be among the 65% women, so as a Muslim, it's a good thing. I uh, just want to add one thing for those soldiers doing this work for many years, is how can you scale up this work with they're doing? Thank you. Sir? My name is Moritz Berger from the Netherlands. Um, a brief question. I have a very distinct impression that makes Europe different from the rest of the world in terms of religion is that it is mainly a debate and a discussion between those who are religious and those who are not, or even anti-religious. And my question is, is that your experience? And is that, have you been working in, exa in, in that domain as well? Thank you. Thank you very much. And so, because so far everyone's been so good at being to the point, if there's a, another person who wants to ask a question, I'm happy to take it. Yes. Quick and short. I just wanted to quickly pick up on what uh, Mr. Kokoma said. So it seems about the problem being whether we ignore religion or inflate religion. One of the, the questions that I have about this program is that despite its wonderful aspirations and attempts to not do this, is there a danger of it still emphasising religion as special or as different or as exceptional or as the problem? Is, does, does, is that something that bothers you as practitioners and would make you think twice about engaging with it? And how could the program endeavour to, to overcome that potential pitfall? Thank you very much indeed. Okay, so uh, very good interventions, very good points to be raised, some good challenging questions as well. Mr Kakoma, would you like to uh, come in? Sure, thank you. Um, first, I am typically very hesitant to talk about my theological formation in the work that I do so as not to be categorized as a religious practitioner. And that may sound problematic in this setting, but it has meaning in the areas where I work. Uh, because we strive in the field of peacemaking at a political level to the best of our ability to be perceived at minimum as sufficiently impartial. That does not negate motivations, worldviews, etc., but to the best of our ability not to insert potential distractions. And I've deliberately chosen that approach in how I go about my work. Mm -hmm. 
As we speak, I would draw your attention to a meeting taking place in Accra, Ghana, on violent extremism in Africa. There are approximately eight heads of state, uh, several uh, special representatives of the Secretary General, uh, the Deputy Foreign Minister of Norway, uh, Germany at a high level, and they're looking at this question with a very different uh, set of participants than are in this room generally. And it's principally from a humanitarian and a security perspective. That's equally problematic because I don't think it touches upon what Dr. Gopin and other colleagues here said in terms of the faith question. But more fundamentally for me, what is problematic, not just about that, but other interventions, is taking lessons, especially from recent crises in parts of the Middle East, and how groups fill vacuums of ungoverned space. And we see that playing out in the Sahel. We see that playing out in parts of southern Libya. And it gets to some other fundamental questions, not just about religion, but about systemic root causes that inspire would be the wrong term, but that attract individuals, communities, societies who are neglected into that filled vacuum. And I think that's a core lesson from what we can call an ISIS epidemic, or even Taliban, right? That there is a filling of a vacuum in ungovernable territories where security, and now you have several outgoing commanders of coalition forces in Afghanistan who clearly say that a military solution is insufficient. Mm. But the question I would have, particularly for representatives from the European Commission, external service, action services, but also from colleagues who have worked in US administrations, to what extent, when we talk about ongoing negotiations now with the Taliban, or broader uh, discussions, the joint comprehensive peace agreement with Iran, to what extent were questions of religious motivation a part of consideration, not necessarily in formula formulating frameworks or agreements, but understanding motivation and even, even kind of larger end goal narratives. Uh, and that would be a question I would throw to Peter and other colleagues here who have advised uh, high level political dialogues where worldview, even if not explicated, is a central divisive <laughs> issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sorry, if I may. Yes, please. One, one final point, and I think it is deeply uh, tied to faith, trust. In, in the where I work and what I do is fundamentally about trust and how you nurture trust. And perception is tied to this, track record is tied to this, consistency is tied to this, etc. And and trust is one of those intangibles, which is relational and oftentimes not able to be institutionalized. And, and that's where I think the term humility has been used on a couple of occasions vis-a-vis -vis this initiative. There, there is a fundamental kind of distrust, uh, and you, you pointed to it, sir, uh, not only between faiths, and, and there I don't mean religion, uh, but also within societies that have experienced and continue to experience cyclical forms of conflict. And trust is, in a sense, uh, part and parcel of the discussion we're talking about. Right. And I'm not sure how that can be reflected upon even more deeply. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Shamil, please. Um, <coughs> so uh, just on a couple of the questions, I, I think of my understanding, I'm not one of the architects, um, but having read uh, the, the design, um, uh, my understanding of one of the ways that, that they've tried to avoid uh, approaching religious actors as a problem is in the themes that they have encouraged um, uh, this platform to facilitate dialogue and cooperation around. Explicitly not, as Peter mentioned earlier, 
freedom of relief, religion and belief or countering violent extremism and the kind of stuff around which religious actors always get invited to and sometimes are only invited to. Exactly. Um, yeah. But climate change, uh, issues of civic engagement, issues of inclusion, inclusion and education. Um, and so I think that's one of the ways that you, that you can go about. I think the other way, and this gets to the question about how do you engage difficult actors. Uh, I mean, uh, my experience, and again, I, you know, I, less me doing it than I had the privilege of representing over 700 full-time staff and thousands of more volunteers and partners. My understanding and experience is that we draw the line of who's kind of beyond the pale and difficult way too early. <laughs> um, and it usually has a lot more to do with our lack of familiarity uh, and our, our inroads uh, to those uh, communities. Um, that, um, and, and so I think Aza's point earlier that uh, one of the things that multilateral institutions should really do is listen. Well, one of the ways that you engage an actor that you might think of as difficult is ask them some questions and find out really what's important to them and what are the issues they care about. And I'd be willing to bet you very often you'll find that there's an overlap between the things they care about or they're scared of or they want to see happen and what other people from different sectors, from different you know, perspectives, from different religions um, are also concerned about. And that provides the starting point. Uh, the whole methodology for our organization, someone used the term common ground before, our name is Search for Common Ground. Uh, common ground is both static and dynamic. It always exists, always exists. There's always some ground for common, you know, that is common. And sometimes with really traumatized communities and where violence is very prevalent, it might, the, the area of common ground you can get people to uh, collaborate around might seem silly. It might be a, literally a football tournament which is the only thing that will get youth and police doing anything together, mm -hmm. or a, a community theater performance that they would, you know. Um, but over time, uh, mobilizing around and providing space for common action on those areas of common ground, however limited they might be, deepens the relationship and opens up other areas of common ground that wouldn't have existed before. Uh, and so the way I would say that you engage quote unquote difficult actors is first, ask them some questions, uh, and if, you can't even get access to them, find someone else who does, uh, and then try to develop some opportunities for them to mobilize on the issues they care about with others in their own communities or on the platform like this. Finally, on the successes, um, there, from our experience, there, there are really three. We looked at, uh, a couple years ago, in, in our nearly 40-year history, where did we feel we had succeeded in catalyzing really sustainable uh, change, meaning change that sustained and even grew long after we stopped being involved in it. And we, f and we found uh, really three categories of sustainable change, which is really what we orient all of our program design and our evaluation around now. You can either affect a shift in institutions, a shift in social norms, or a shift in markets. And if you achieve any of those three things, that change that has been triggered is no longer reliant on any kind of external support because an institution has bought onto it for their own reasons. A Ministry of Education has adopted a new curriculum. A police force has adopted a community policing initiative for their own reasons and they own it and they're proud of it. Uh, or there's a shift in social norms. A critical mass of the population is now talking about dealing with uh, their differences in a new kind of way. Um, or you give rise to local markets, complete with supply, demand, and capital, where they're actually, a, a peace building approach is actually being resourced locally and not dependent on EU funding or any external engagement. Um, and that kind of change, just to say, for at least with our methodology, when we looked at all of the examples, over 40 examples of this that we studied, um, it tends to take somewhere between eight to 10 years. You can generate results faster. You can resolve a dispute faster. You can do some nice projects faster than that. But if you're trying to shift institutions, give rise to new markets, or affect a shift in social norms, it's a, it's a long-term endeavor. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the, 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 those we expect. Right, and very, very quickly, Shamir, because I need to go to Stefania. Yeah, just technology and so the very virtual quickly, exchange. I'm sorry, thank you, Shadda. So, um, because of some people in this room, uh, the field of virtual exchange uh, has really uh, gained traction in recent years. The first dedicated fund for virtual exchange was announced by former President, U.S. President Barack Obama, uh, and the second dedicated fund for this field is now uh, established here in the European Commission. Uh, and briefly, virtual exchanges are technology-enabled, sustained, not one-off, people-to-people mm -hmm. education programs. They are not a Facebook chat room. Um, there's a pedagogy to them, there's some element of facilitation, 
And uh, this is a field that holds tremendous promise for a few reasons. One, it vastly expands the number and the diversity of people who have access to a really meaningful cross-cultural educational experience. Two, it enables you to vastly expand, uh, extend um, the duration of engagement across differences. You don't have to be purely reliant on, on being able to fly people to visit with one another. Uh, and I would say that with this initiative, um, I, would be, um, I would very much hope that virtual exchanges would be integrated into a platform like this um, in one of two ways, either on the front end, I think most people think about it the back end. We're gonna do a physical exchange and then mm -hmm. we'll have some sort of social media thing that will continue. Uh, with a really powerful virtual exchange on the front end, you can establish extraordinary breakthroughs, sense of commonalities, you surface areas that, oh, I'd love to work on that with you, so that when people come together physically, they're ready to go. They've already started, you know, they've built, broken down some of the barriers of trust, they've gotten to know one another, uh, and they can start doing things in a much more active kind of way, or on, on the back end. Uh, and I'll finish with that on, you know, people tend to assume that you can't have a profound, profound educational impact online and that you know, virtual exchanges are, are, you know, we with the European Commission's funded pilot on this, we've now uh, had 12,000 young people go through virtual exchanges over the last two years, um, more than 60% of them women um, across uh, this region, the Southern Mediterranean uh, region. There are two things that virtual exchanges are very powerful at that actually oftentimes are better than physical exchanges. One is um, it, you can much more powerfully embed uh, an experience if it happens iteratively over time than if it's in concentrated in just uh, one or two days or two weeks. You think about it if you were studying. Uh, I used to procrastinate a lot. If you don't study all semester and then you cram the night before the exam, you might do okay the next day, but you'll forget all of it a week later. Uh, many concentrated exchange programs are like that. They take people out of their natural environment, they have this exotic, wonderful experience, and then they go back and it's very difficult to assimilate. One thing that virtual exchanges enable is what's called spaced learning. Every week, you're having this interaction and you're constantly assimilating that interaction and that new educational experience with your daily life. In, su in subconscious ways, it really embeds. It's, very, uh, it's a very uh, powerful tool. And finally, um, the last thing on, on what we've learned with virtual exchanges, the most powerful experience for somebody to have in order to become a more constructive and willing participant in a diverse community, the most powerful experience they can have is not the experience of being agreed with by those who they feel are different from them. It's the experience of being heard and respected by them, mm -hmm. even when disagreed with. So when someone says something, you say, I totally disagree with you, I'm even offended by what you said, but I wanna understand where you're coming from. Have you had personal experiences that make you feel this way? Um, that experience of being disagreed with but actually respected uh, is what makes people much more willing and eager to continue to engage across cultural divides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shomi. Stephen. Yeah, there, there's a lot there. Um, thank there is. You. Um, first, just about contact, and I'm, I, I'd be really interested to know, you know, now we have another form of contact, which is online and, and virtual exchange. Um, this is another bow in our quiver, uh, yeah, bow in our quiver. In order to engage, we need multiple points of contact between ourselves to really uh, build trust and have a healthy engagement. That being said, what I understand from this platform, it is not a dialogue circle. It is what I see it as a laboratory for practitioners to come together to think through what are the problems that we have in society and what to do about them. To face the same direction and I hope there will be opportunity to, um, for, for those practitioners to have a common agenda to really have a collective impact approach a common agenda, shared metrics across, mm -hmm. talked about what is, how do we know it works? Well, everybody's working on different metrics. Um, and I, I, I really like Sh Shamil's overall meta, how do we see change? But all organizations are using different metrics, so let's get on to a very similar metric um, in order to, s to really gauge our 
uh, development towards this final goal. Um, so that being said, we, we, we want everybody in. And I'm really glad the non-religious are being talked about um, as part of the program. Uh, it's essential. I, I'd love it in the name, but uh, for, for whatever reasons, it's not. But uh, I, I, I should say I changed the three-phase form into uh, an inclusive faith and belief forum um, because we were working in the public and it was essential for when working in universities to be fully inclusive. That doesn't mean that we can't have bilateral conversations, of, um, but it means that we're speaking with everybody. And this also put, does make sure that religion is not put over here. It is here. And what we want is for this conversation to be part and, par part and parcel of society to embed as mm -hmm. possible, for everybody to have this lens mm -hmm. and all the lenses uh, along the way around race, disability, sexuality, et cetera. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Elisabeth, please. Okay, I will try to go example by example uh, um, as uh, the questions were um, uh, discussed. So on the question, how do we measure success of our projects? Uh, on the um, uh, issue of bringing Serbs and Croats together, we received also the question from Greek Cypriot uh, Orthodox Church, mm -hmm. if we could do the same exchange between Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. So we said, okay, if uh, this was already good and people liked it, then somebody else is also going the to... The word spreads, the message wish. spreads. Yes, okay. so that was uh, one of the examples. On the issue of populism, which is really very problematic for us living on this continent, uh, as Conference of European Churches, we are organizing the next month conference uh, which is called Alternative to Populism from Human Rights Perspective. And uh, for this uh, discussion, we have invited also those who have populist views because we cannot discuss populism just by ourselves, Absolutely. for ourselves, because we, when somebody comes to the church or to the mosque or synagogue, I guess no one is asking, sorry, are you populist <laughs> or you are not? <laughs> oh, well, if you are, then you stay out and, or the other way around. So. This is why we think that it would be good to have open debate and to look into the root causes, why things are as they are. Instead of, I think it's very bad tactics if somebody is just removed because we don't like the, uh, someone's opinion. Uh, because we speak about pluralism, well, we have to make this pluralism in happening in reality. And not only talking about pluralism, mm -hmm. how it is good, but then uh, we avoid it when it's necessary and crucial. Uh, on the question of anti-religious voices, uh, I need to say that as Conference of European Churches, last month we have organized a training uh, on freedom of expression and hate crime that uh, so many churches and religious communities and also humanists are exposed to. The good speaker on fake news, because that was part of discussion with this virtual world and so on, actually came from the humanist background. And I have heard this speaker uh, in European Parliament during the dialogue on Article 17. And then uh, hearing the person, his name is Michael Floyd, and it's a really brilliant scholar on uh, fake news, I have asked him, would you mind to speak to the church audience? And then he came. Of course, there were different feelings and so on, but it was interesting that he accepted and he's going to come back uh, in our events. So it means it is possible and it was not okay. so uh, difficult. One of the worries that I have is uh, this program on global exchange on religion in society is going to create lots of exchanges, not only within the program, but it's going to create spill yes, effect spill on uh, various exchanges happening. Right. And then is the question how to finance this further exchanges which are going to be requested, right. how to find really neutral uh, financial grants for this to flourish on the grassroots level. We will talk about that because we do have with us uh, uh, Hilde Hardman from the Foreign Policy Instrument, so I think that would be one of your concerns as well, how to make this sustainable. So thank you very much for bringing that point forward. Um, I don't know, Mr. Kakuma, do you really need to come in now? Oh, you're fine because we are running slightly late, but not too late. So let just please join me in thanking our practitioners. I think we've got some. <laughs> really good 
good practical advice about how to take this forward. And I, I saw Mereta, as always, taking very, very copious notes. And of course, the discussion will continue uh, in this, this afternoon as well, because we have a discussion on religious engagement in diplomacy, lessons learned. There's a uh, working group on that, the role of religion in peace building. Of course, we touched on that today, uh, this morning. A religion in society, power and politics in the Middle East and also on engaging exclusive and conservative religious actors in diverse uh, contexts. So the conversation continues this afternoon. It's my pleasure now to give the floor to Christian Leffler. Uh, actually, Christian, I'm going to tell that story about you in Barcelona coming out. Oh, this is a very interesting story about <laughs> Christian Leffler. Uh, so I used to be a journalist, I think you've more or less understood, and uh, I was covering, I think it was the first meeting of the Euro-Mediterranean Dialogue. Uh, it, not the first, but anyway, one of the meetings in, in Barcelona. And uh, I was given privileged access to Christian Leffler because I knew him and he came out and he was absolutely livid. He'd come out of a ministerial meeting between the Europeans and the Arab delegations. And he came out and he said to me, you know, I'm just going crazy because every time, this is to show how far we've come, every time I try to talk and put into the communique or the final statement something to do with religious actors, civil actors, civic society, civic society, and especially religious actors, I get a response from the Arab world, which is no, we are not going to have a reference to this. So from that day, to today, Christian, you guys have come a long way because uh, we have spent the whole morning now and of course we're launching the Religion in Society initiative which is about religion in society. So congratulations again to, the, again to those who have persevered uh, through this long journey. So with that, Christian, let me give you the floor and ask the panelists to um, retreat from the stage. I think Christian can speak from here, yeah. All right, Shada, thank you very much for those words of introduction. Um, we have come a long way, but I fear there's still a long way to go. Uh, I suspect that quite a lot of the European participants in those meetings on the Euromed were quite relieved that they didn't have to object to introducing religion and contacts with um, non-state yeah, no, actors. Yeah, and yeah. State and religion is a, a different subject. Do we need to come um, in, in those conclusions we were working on over several years. Um, but let me, let me first say thank you all for being here. Um, thank you to those who worked hard to prepare this meeting and to prepare the platform for the Global Exchange. Um, I am glad to see this taking form, taking shape and moving forward. I'm not able to follow it as closely as I would like. Um, witnessed by the fact that I came in halfway through this panel and, and caused a, a slight disturbance. Um, but uh, I, I'm convinced of the importance of this theme for um, the effectiveness of our policies. Now, I work in the foreign policy area, in the external policies. I'm equally convinced that this is essential for the effectiveness of many of our internal policies in the Union, uh, and I'll touch on that briefly in a moment. Um, before I move on to that and to complete the thanks, um, I would like to extend warm thanks equally to the uh, Lokai Foundation um, as a partner and for the tireless work that they have taken forward, notably under the leadership of Peter, Peter Mandeville with Gwen Griffiths Dixon and Dilma Hussein, please pass on my thanks to them as well, um, which has allowed us in partnership to get to where we are today. Now, this morning, to open this meeting, um, the High Representative Federica Mogherini 
um, outline the thrust of this initiative, the philosophy behind it, the ambitions that nourishes. Um, the hope that through this platform, through this conversation, we can gain a better understanding of how we can work with and through religion in a more, say, more effective and more constructive manner. Um, the effectiveness and constructiveness should come from us as bureaucrats, as officials, or as representatives of government all the way up to the political level. Far from it would it be from me to um, talk about effectiveness and constructiveness if they were even the right terms uh, in terms of religious practices and um, those who give religious guidance. But it has to be um, See, it has been noted, it has where I think we would all agree, that there is, if you like, good religion and bad faith. Um, basically, all religion, at least all the large monotheistic faiths, um, emphasize, and it was mentioned here earlier, the, ess the essence of trust and tolerance in society. They are part of the organizing principles of civilization. And they create an element of trust and faith of the individual in taking their own lives forward, but also through that, the trust and tolerance of others. But we know that that is also often misinterpreted, misused, exploited for other purposes and to foment the opposite, to foment fear, suspicion, confrontation, whatever it takes. Now, and the, the comment was made uh, by uh, a commentator giving a Dutch example Europe overall is probably the most secular of societies, the most secular of continents. I come from one of the most secular countries in Europe. I'm Swedish. Some people even talk of it as a post-religious society. I think that's wrong. It is secular in the terms of a relative absence of regular religious practice by a large part of the population. But what we forget is that religion is still with us and the religious principles, positive and negative. Um, give two examples of how this can work. If you like one positive and one negative, and the positive is because um, it shows the value of engaging those who still not just believe but practice their faith. Now I'll start with the other one. When we were, when we had finalized the negotiations for Sweden's accession to the European Union, we finalized those in 1994, and in the autumn of 1994 there was a referendum to decide whether or not Sweden would join, which we did on the 1st of January, 95. That is, the last time, and I really hope, literally the last time, that I've heard in public debate in my country, people warning the voters against the influence of papists. <laughs> papists, <laughs> the Catholic. This is 350 years after the Peace of Westphalia, which put an end to the last religious war that Sweden was involved in. And they still talk about papists. I'm not sure those who did really realized they were not fervent fundamentalist Protestants. They were pretty mainstream politicians, some centre-right, some centre-left. But it shows how deeply ingrained it is in us. And we ignore it at our peril. That also means that when we are 
confronted with those who are more strongly anchored in their faith and who practice it regularly, whether daily, weekly, whatever, there risks being a degree of incomprehension, which makes it more difficult to build the bridges. The, 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 the positive example I wanted to give was we saw in 2015 with a big wave of refugees and other migrants arriving in Sweden where essentially in the past, in the last four months of the year, the population increased by 2% through people voting with their feet. Um, receiving them, integrating, helping with a degree of assimilation, as always, was difficult. Some of the most successful examples, a large majority of those who were arriving were of Muslim faith or coming from Muslim societies. Mostly Syria, but also Iraq, Afghanistan, a number of others. And they got to see the, the social assistants and this and that and the other, um, who tried to help in a very rational way, which was maybe not always the best way of receiving people who'd gone through incredible hardship and the pain of being torn away from their society. The most successful examples of rapid integration were a number of women's groups. And they were organized by the Jewish women associations and the Catholic women's associations in Sweden. Because they were people who were anchored in their faith. They could understand, they could communicate. So again, the importance of remembering, of building on what is a heritage which we are aware of, which we are proud of, which we are conscious of and practicing, or which is there in the subconscious, in the latent, and which therefore then risks taking negative forms like the fear of papists. I think from what I heard a little bit here and from what I understand from before, your discussions this morning have underscored, therefore, that one major challenge is learning from each other. Look for best practices. How can we improve ways of engaging, of communicating, of living together, of using faith as one element in building bridges? of being aware of how this may be represented in media and other places of public discourse, positively and negatively, how to work on countering the negative messages, intentional or in unintentional, that may lead to a spiral of suspicion and fear rather than one of confidence and tolerance. We obviously work a lot as officials, as diplomats, with governments. Uh, we work within legal frameworks. But we need to break out of that and we need to find other partners. We need to work with religious authorities and religious practitioners, as well as, of course, many other representatives of our diverse societies, our in the inclusive sense of yours, ours, all of the diverse societies, to find the right kind of balanced approach. You know that the European Union, we're a lot of suckers for civil society. We always want to involve civil society. Some of um, the authorities in the countries where you come from are rather less enthusiastic about this, um, should be said. Some of our member states are also rather less enthusiastic about it. It depends on what civil society. But we do profoundly think that we need to reach out. Maybe we even believe it more as EU than as national um, authorities or national officials, because we are, in a sense, inevitably 
one step further removed from the daily reality of people. And therefore, to understand that reality and to re-engage, we have to jump over the governments and reach out to civil society. So we, we try to do that. We want to connect. We want to connect all the way down to the grassroots. Um, we want to learn about experiences, the concerns that people have, what solutions they see, what solutions you see through the exchanges in a platform like this, what strategies we can promote, how we can encourage greater participation, stronger dialogue, greater respect. And through that, can we work to foster social inclusion? And I say that in all these different dimensions, maybe societal inclusion, because it can be social, it can be economic, it can be ethnic, it can be political, and it can be religious in a tolerant, open-ended sort of way. How do we fight exclusionary politics, of which we've seen too much in Europe and elsewhere? We see its ugly manifestations in virtually every continent uh, on a fairly regular basis. So this work on religious tolerance, faith issues, and the exchange of, exchange of experience, we hope will help us become better at our work. Um, hence, this is not some sort of nice altruistic plan, but self-interest is the strongest interest of all. So if this drives us to bring you in here, because we think we'll get better at what we do, I think that should be a reassurance to you more than anything else. Um, we need to see, as I said before, to understand better and to be aware more of the place of religion in our societies, even in post-religious societies, because it is there. It is there all the time. I could give many other examples, but I won't, because I've spoken too long already. And we need to find, therefore, also um, and understand and help other people become more aware of who speaks for or on behalf of religion. Who can legitimately say they speak? What is their legitimacy? How do they situate themselves? How can we look at it with a critical eye to find a right, balanced, critical but res respectful approach. I rather like the idea which was mentioned earlier of developing virtual exchanges, because I think in a religious context, at least for someone like me who is sort of pre-cyber, um, this idea of a virtual exchange, communicating with or through the ether, um, brings in a dimension which um, <coughs> is, is different from the day-to-day, down-to-earth and hands-on. But I think what um, we hope to achieve with you is to develop the, the understanding, develop new approaches to how we can partner and how we can bring in um, practitioners and faith-based organizations in partner countries around the world, in stable situations, in conflict situations, in post-conflict situations, um, and gain that better understanding of what their place is, what the place and role of religion is, and how we can support that in a positive and constructive manner. How to have that engagement and how we bring it into the work we do. So with that, again, let me thank you all for being here. Let me share with you my frustration that I will not be able to be here in the afternoon because of other engagements, but I do look forward to hearing more about the outcomes of your work, and I wish you all the best for the afternoon as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christian Leffler. Could I ask now Hilda Hartman from the Foreign Policy Instrument, director there, to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. Hello, everybody. 
Um, first of all, I join Christian in extending warm thanks to all of you for being here, for sharing your thoughts and your experiences, for all your discussions and exchanges today and in the months that have preceded this event. And I would like to thank you in particular for the heart and the soul that you are putting into this undertaking, because the issues that you are discussing go to the heart of what we are as human beings and to the essence, to the soul of our societies. Special thanks to the Lokai Foundation, to Peter, Gwen, Dilbar, and to all colleagues, and there are many of them, and some who have in particular been pushing this, so all uh, our thanks to all colleagues who have been working for months and months to make this happen. Now, religion and personal beliefs, be they faith-based or not, have the power to transform societies for the better or the worse. And we have here in Europe a long history that has learned us a lot about that, in the good way and in the bad way. Religion can be a social force to tackle some of the most fundamental issues of our time. It can help in reducing social inequalities, making peace, building open societies, and it does that best in diverse and pluralistic societies. Again, another lesson that we have learned in, the Euro in Europe the hard way. Religious tolerance and respect for diversity, especially towards religious minorities, pluralism and diversity are really key to more just, more peaceful and more open societies. Christian referred to the warnings at the time of the referendum in Sweden, uh, to be aware of the papers. Um, the European Union was founded on the lessons that we had learned over all these centuries. And the idea of pluralism and diversity is really at the core of what the European Union is. That's why the European Union has and will continue to support measures that promote freedom of religion and or belief, diversity, fight radicalization. The way to peaceful and positive coexistence is a long one. It does not stop with constitutional rights. To rally for peaceful, diverse and inclusive societies means daily work, constant dialogue and exchanges at all levels. And that is what the exchange platform that we are launching today is about. Your work in the platform, your exchanges, the heart and the soul that you put in it will feed into all what we do, from our work on conflict prevention and peace building uh, to our actions on empowerment and cooperation across the globe. And I wish you all success in filling this pioneering exchange platform with life. We want this platform to live, we want it to grow, uh, nourished by your experiences, your thoughts, again, your heart, your soul, um, so that it really can deliver and contribute to better societies, a better world. Thank you again. Safe travels home, but before that you still have a day of discussion and first a lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hilda. So uh, the morning's proceedings have come to an end. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you to the panelists and the organizers for uh, a fascinating and very, very insightful day. Uh, I've been told by the organizers that lunch is downstairs. There are ushers who will take you there. And I've also been told by some friends that those who want to pray, there's a Juma prayer at 12.41 uh, at, a, at a mosque that is not, uh, sorry, uh, 13.41. Uh, at a mosque nearby, I think you find some instructions if you ask the right people. So thank you very much indeed. Let's give ourselves a hand of applause once again. <laughs> and uh, see you soon. Uh, bon appétit. <laughs>